Welcome everybody and good afternoon. Um, welcome to day two of the Culture Word National Black Writers Conference for 2021. And we're so happy that you're here and so happy that you're here for this great workshop, really important for the future of all of us writers. Um, just to say who I am, my name is Cheryl Martin and I'm the co-chair of Common Word, Culture Word. And I'm a middle-aged black woman with medium sort of brown skin, uh, a very round face <laughs> because I'm a little bit on the full figured side. Uh, I have um, sort of like a short Afro of, of very curly hair. I've got a couple of dangly earrings that are multicolored. I'm wearing a light pink round neck sweater. And behind me, you can see uh, the bottom half of a really lovely painting from a, an emerging Ghanaian painter. And you can also see my teal covered sofa on one side. And then on the other side, some pink and white flowers in a blue and white vase. And you might just see a little succulent in a pot that looks like Frida Kahlo. So that's me. And um, this panel is called Going Digital. And all of the, the, conference, the conference theme overall is we want to dream. And that's obviously riffing on Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which is almost 60 years old now. And I was talking to a lot of other Black artists during this pandemic. And what kept coming up was that people wanted the freedom to create whatever they wanted to create without fitting into somebody else's preconceptions of what their art should be like, or you know how they should write or not write, or just who they are as artists. So that's what we want to dream meant to us. And I've given um, all the panelists the freedom to respond to that in the way that they like. Um, for going digital, this is about the digital future of literature and how that crosses over with other digital art. And so we have two wonderful panelists with us today. Um, and I'll, I'll just get my notes up, sorry. Beth Senior is the program lead for the foundation year and academic lead for outreach and equality, diversity and inclusion at Manchester Metropolitan University's New School of Digital Arts, or SODA. As outreach lead and EDI coordinator, Beth supports the team in developing their recruitment and increasing the widening participation from diverse communities onto degree programs, engaging young people both locally and further afield. Originally training as a three-dimensional designer, Beth has over 20 years experience of teaching games and creative digital media. With an MA in animation, she has presented at educational conferences and had her work included in a documentary looking at British women in animation. Beth's design background has always informed her choices, and she has embraced new technology throughout her career. Her practice has explored the concept of being a dual professional, looking at how creative practitioners can maintain their creative practice while working in education. She's passionate about widening participation in the arts and decolonizing the curriculum and art subjects. Yes, looking at how it can be embedded into non-traditional discourse spaces and how our creative practice can be used to illustrate culture and drive positive societal change. As program lead for SOTO's foundation year, Beth leads on the continuing development of the foundation year and contributes to the development and delivery of the BA Game Art for the School of Digital Arts. Michaela Sonola is an author and creative writing mentor. She has published fiction, poetry, and a multi-narrative adventure online story called Changeling. Her young adult novel is a spin-off of that digital tale and will be published in 2022. Michaela has been leading creative writing workshops for over 25 years and leads the novel writing group for Common Word and has a flair for creating safe spaces for writers to find their voice and develop their craft. When she's not writing or teaching, you'll find her on, you'll find her walking her dog, honey, or reading on her boat. Lucky her. Um, visit uh, www.facebook.com slash group slash right here with Michaela 
where she presents a free weekly writing workshop. Um, and we also want to thank the British Council, gotta thank those funders, um, the Arts Council who are our main funder, because um, we are a black led literature national portfolio organization for the Arts Council and the British Council who's, um, we, got a, we got a special grant for digital work and that's, that is what is funding this and the going digital competition. You'll hear a bit more about later. But now, um, I don't know which one of you is going first, Michaela or Beth. So um, should I be going? Should I be going to Michaela or to Beth yes, first? Yeah. To yes, Michaela yes. first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. That's a lovely. Um introduction. Um, I am a brown skinned woman with and I'm wearing glasses with very dark rims. I've got a pair of headphones sitting on top of my head. In the background it looks like there's a sort of tropical plant growing out of one ear and on the other side there is a I have a load of books sitting on uh, my radiators and a shelf with some childlike paintings. Um, I must have, I must not correct, but when I say I'm writing on my boat, <laughs> my bed is called a boat. And my kids have called my bed a boat for many, 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 many years. And even my younger nephews. And yeah, so when I say I'm sitting on my boat, it sounds very lofty, but it is just my bed. So that's that's my fashion. OK, so as um, Cheryl mentioned, I'm an author, I'm a writing mentor and co-founder of an indie publisher. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to be asking you to collect some thoughts. So go ahead and just grab whatever you need to write with. So my journey as a writer started in theatre. So I grew up dreaming to be um, an actor on the stage. And um, there were so many reasons why I didn't pursue that dream as an adult. Um, and the main one for me was in my teens, the roles that I wanted were cut off from me. So I remember losing the role of Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz to somebody who literally could not hold a tune I was livid but she was white and the fit and she and she fit the look that they wanted for the play um, and I didn't also understand the incredulity of the director when and at another audition I'd got up on the stage and announced that I was auditioning for the role the, the lead role of My Fair Lady um, apparently that didn't um, they didn't think I fit that role either so my creativity found another way to flow so I've performed my own work, I've published poetry, short stories, and um, my debut novel, Dead Dogs and Angels, was published in 2018 by Holland House Books. Um, now, currently, I'm working on a young adult trilogy, and it's based 250 years in the future. Um, my interest in in digital literature is very much grounded in my desire to share my stories with young people of colour. And while I absolutely love and adore books, our youth today reads in many different ways. And I'm interested in building bridges between my work and my readership, most of whom live their lives online and on social media. So my first experiment into this was um, a spin-off of my current work in progress called Changeling. And it is a multi-natural, multi-natural, multi-narrative text adventure, which some people call Choose Your Own Adventure as well. So I'd like to just quickly show you um, a slide uh, that might just, just to give you an, a bit of an idea of how the software that I use to create this spin-off is called Twine and how, how it kind of gives you a general idea how it, how it looks. Okay, thanks Beth. So Twine is um, an open source tool for telling interactive non-linear stories. On the left hand side you see um, a box um, with a pale blue background and there's lots of little boxes in there and each box can be can have a little thread to another so every little section that you create so maybe the beginning of a story has a decision that the reader must make 
So out of that comes two choices. And then from each of those two choices, another two choices. So you can see that the story begins to kind of grow exponentially. Um, there we go. Um, but those images allow you, I just wanted to show you those images because it gives you an idea of the shape of the story that you're doing. Um, and so you can see that even like a really, really simple story with one character can get very complicated very quickly. So, you know, one of the first things I realized is I had this like massive idea uh, with several characters and realized that actually that would might take half my lifetime. So I started with a very simple second person narrative. Um, okay, so um, yeah, and if if you're interested, I'm just I'm just gonna pop in the the chat. Um, yeah, I don't need that screen now. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, I've just got to find the chat. Um, in case that you're interested in, where is the chat? Ah, there it is. I can't do it now, so I'll do it later. But anyway, there's if you Google SoundCloud, Common Word, Culture Word, Identity, um, Identity had an anthology on there called Loose Connections, and I'm reading from that. And if you'd like to play Changeling, you can, you, you can, I've put it on a platform called Text Adventures, and you can just go ahead and Google it, the Changeling on Text Adventures, and you'll get it there. So the theme of this conference is we have a dream. And so I started to talk uh, this talk by telling you about my, my childhood dream of treading the boards. And, but I think dreaming is, is really poignant to this panel, particularly because there's this idea that the notion that is dangled in front of us, that technology, that this ever-growing, ever-changing digital landscape has the potential to level the playing field for all of us. And maybe that's true, but I just want to back the tr truck up first, because what is one person's dream is another person's nightmare. Before we can even dream about the potential of technology, that could have on our work as writers, we have to make sure that we remove some pretty hefty barriers first. I'm talking about barriers to training, education, equipment, resources, and that sort of big massive fear of technology some of us have. And I, I definitely have find myself in this just staring at the screen going, oh my God. Um, there are so many potential avenues um, to present our work today and we are overwhelmed with the choice and the shoulds you know you should be on this platform you should be on that platform you should be blogging you should be tweeting and so on and what is right what is wrong well I don't think there is a right or wrong in fact I'm going to go a step further and say that the question is irrelevant. And so I've come up with some questions that just for the next minute or so, you can just jot one or two down and answer them yourself in the chat, which whatever way you want to do it. So here's some questions that I'm asking myself when I'm creating digitally born content. What stories do you want to tell? What stories do you want to experience? Who do you want to share them with? Who do you want to experience them with? So if you can just have a think about those questions and you can either write a few comments in the chat or just write them down, or you can write down the questions and perhaps it's something that you want to explore um, in your journal later. But it, these are the kind of things that I'm asking myself constantly, whether it's, to tell a story, whatever we're doing, whether we're marketing something, whether, we, whether we're doing something creative, we're always telling stories. Okay, so the question of how we can, as traditional writers, open ourselves up to new technologies and new audiences, kind of to have an open mind and we have to be willing to experiment. We have to get prepared for new technology. We have to upskill. We have to be engaging in it, not burying our head in the sand. Um, we have to open up to these new opportunities and collaborations. And 
in terms of black women in black women in particular uh, and certainly people that I know very well is that there's this this tendency to think that we have to do it all on our own and we don't we don't have to do it all on our own and then there's broadening our understanding of what's out there exploring what we ourselves like what is a good fit for us what's a good fit for you what do you like you know one of the things that Beth and I have agreed on is whatever the technology you always have to craft good content what do you like what is it that you're trying to say so Beth and I had the pleasure of judging the entries to this com competition um, they were all compelling and I want to just quickly applaud all of our entrants. This was a massive challenge and you had a very short time to come up with your pieces. So thank you so much for your courage um, of sending them in. Um, I'm gonna hand you over to Beth uh, and perhaps she can give some of those barriers a run for their money. Thanks very much for listening. Hi, thanks Michaela for that. Um, so yeah, so like Michaela said, I'm here to talk about a little bit more about the kind of digital literature aspect of what we're talking about and what what you as writers can, um, what things you can harness to um, help with that. So we've got um, things that we're kind of used to, but you know, if you if you were to put in a um, a uh, description of digital literature. Sorry, I just derailed myself because I realized I forgot to describe myself. Um, so just very, very quickly, um, I have, um, I've got glasses on. I'm a black woman. I've got glasses on. I've got a um, sort of like spirally, my hair's bordering between spiral curls and Afro today. And there's nothing interesting directly behind me apart from a wall. I, I do have books and they are sitting off to the side. I am an avid reader, but you just can't see them on the screen. Um, so yeah, that that's me. Um, so yeah, back to what we mean by digital literature. Um, so if you to look, if that's where I was up to, if you were to look it up, it would say that digital literature is about accessing um, writing on a device. That's that that's the kind of current definition. So whether that be a Kindle, Insta Stories, tweets, um, and uh, Messenger, which is much more conversational between a group of people. And then for me, Facebook starts to bridge the gap between writing and using, you know, using things. Well, Insta does it as well, but using things um, like your videos, your pictures, whatever, what you know, your animations, whatever you want to do to uh, support that story. Um, and then you have the ones that are more visual, which which are about capturing moments in time like TikTok and Snapchat. And then you can expand on that when you look at bigger platforms like YouTube, which gives you the space to uh, put much more content on. Um, so they allow you to um, those kinds of apps allow you to use to share snippets of stories um, and then go a little bit further. But I see them as more community based because uh, quite a few of those rely on the reactions of your community to sort of like drive what else you might say. So that's the kind of digital literature side from, from my perspective. And then when we're thinking of, um, if you look at a de upper definition of digital storytelling, then you start to be thinking about getting answers that start to introduce the idea of audience um, interacting and s interaction and sitting within a more visual world. So it's much more about um, audience participation. So it's more of a participatory format. And we start thinking of more transmedia narratives. So where one story can, uh, can cross lots of different platforms. It's the same universe, it's the same story world, but it can sit in lots of different platforms. Um, uh, and Star Wars is a really brilliant example of that because it's, you know, it's games, it's films, it's animations, it's books. It's, it's franchising, et cetera, et cetera. So you can find lots of definitions, but one that I really like is this fairly simple one, which talks about it being the shared universe in which the settings, characters, objects, event, and actions, or one of more narratives exist. So I always think that's a really nice way to approach um, digital storytelling, but what does that mean for writers who are, you know, sort of grounded in the traditional and, and, and what can you harness? To take your writing forward. So one of the things that I wanted to um, talk about or, or think about today 
is what are the emergent technologies and platforms that writers could be looking at and what um, more kind of digital storytelling techniques can can these can these technologies offer writers how can it expand their medium and where can technology take traditional writers who may be aspiring to embrace more digital storytelling techniques because what we have here are technologies that are much more reliant on or for the most part re reliant on on that participatory experience um, and also the, there's a combination of the visual visual so for me good stories and narratives are about immersion um, even if it's something quite passive and we talked about the on our workshop for any of you that were able to attend we talked about um you know you know passive you know lean forward versus lean back so sort of like passive interaction with a media or um, a more participatory action like a game where you're playing but these kind of technologies can give that to writers in my opinion um so if we're looking at something like vr it allows audiences to fully immerse themselves 360 into these story worlds which is one that we're kind of possibly more familiar with even though it's potentially the most um Hard. I, I think sometimes it can be quite difficult to engage with. Um, I remember trying on a, a headset years ago when they were new and they were very disorienting, uh, but they've come a long way. So that's great. <laughs> then you get something like your AR. So, um, you know, you kind of Pokemon Go world where you can get where you can immerse people and they can go out into the world and then they can pick up elements. And I think that's a really nice thing to think about from a from a storytelling, but also as a writer, because instead of like picking up a you know instead of having an augmented reality where you hold up a screen and then you have an image in front of you but by holding up a screen it changes or it animates or a little character appears in this real world a little virtual character i was just thinking when we were coming together to this and thinking about what if that was pages of a book what if you were sending people out to pick up your pages and actually take that time to stand and read but combine that technology but still go out into that physical world to explore stories or you could get them to you know pick up things from your stories um something that um for the next one something that people are very familiar with or more familiar with i think are podcasts um but again i'm gonna show you a um some well give you a link to something a little bit later um, because there's some really nice things being done with podcasts that are actually getting people whilst listening to act out what's going on in the story so again getting your audience to engage and be more much you know very participatory in the in the in the experience because we know that writing is really emotive we know these stories can move us um you know and, and and sort of like you know make us just fill so what if we're moving at the same time what if we're actually Im immersing ourselves in that story in a, in a much more interactive way um and then the last one that I just wanted to sort of put on your radar today, as it were, was um, GPT-3, which if you're not familiar with, it's, a, it's an AI text generator. So um, there's lots of different websites that you can um, look at, and I will drop one in a chat when I'm not multitasking on my screens. Um, but um, GPT, GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And three is the kind of latest iteration of it. And it used, we were talking earlier, actually, but it used to be only for the scientists, only for the researchers, but it's much, it's become um, accessible to all now. So this is something that you as writers, you can actually harness this and it works. We hear this phrase machine learning quite a lot. So um, for the science side of it, and if you, if you look, if you go and look it up, you'll find that it's, it's based on a, a neural network. So machine learning and it's trained using data to generate um, any type of text. So we've all been on those kind of like chatbots where it's asking you if the service was good. This takes it a little bit further um, because you can give it you can give it um, the data and it learns to expand on those parameters. And, you know, in action, it's really interesting because you can you can start to ask it quite you know, depending on the data you put into it, big questions. So like, what's the world going to be like in the future? And the bot might go, well, actually, this and this and this has happened and humans are doing this. And it's just really quite exciting. So from a storytelling perspective, I feel that that opens up some really great possibilities for developing narratives. Um, and traditional writers could use it in all sorts of ways. So you could use it to, yes, you can use all of these to expand your ideas or overcoming blocks, 
if um, Cheryl was talking about writing blocks and barriers, or, a, or just think of a different way of developing your narratives, you know, and some of these things, particularly something like GPT-3, it is about sharing the control over your story because your AI will take, take you somewhere with it. But I think that can be really exciting as well. So although a lot of these are usually a visual experience, there are more options out there for, like I've said before, exploring ways of creating narrative and still utilize your traditional methods. You don't have to kind of go, oh, I can't, if I want to do digital storytelling, I can't be a traditional writer anymore. In, in fact, you can be, in, you know, some, some way, maybe even a more traditional writer than you thought of. And I believe that writers could look at these things and use these technologies as a way to repurpose the story um, by allowing people to engage in it in a different way. So that's um, what I wanted to kind of bring to you today in terms of the things that you can consider as writers and not be scared of those barriers that we're talking about and, 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 and embrace them and, and play with them. You know, writing and storytelling is about being very playful. So I think it's, it's really nice to know what's out there and, you know, see what's accessible. And a lot of these things have got, um, you, you know, you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be doing lo loads of research in the area. A lot of them are very accessible. So I've just got one that I mentioned Digital Dozen before. Um, so I just wanted to show you this and the website for this. And again, I will drop that in the chat um, when I'm not multitasking my slides. Um, it's called digitaldozen.io. So these are awards that are offered for breakthroughs in storytelling. And they're presented actually by the Columbia University School of, Digi Art, School of Arts and Digital Storytelling. And they are in recognition of the year's most um, innovative narratives. If you do manage to um, have a go, so it's digitaldozen.io, like I said, I will put it in the chat, um, check out um, a play inside, which is the one at the bottom with um, the lady lying on her boat. <laughs> um, and that's the podcast one where you're, you're directed to um, act out the podcast as you're listening to it so that's a really interesting one to watch but you know do do have a look at some of those um so um that's it for me for now so i'm going to at that point i'm going to stop sharing my screen like that and then i am going to hand back to cheryl i do believe Yes, it is me, I do believe. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Michaela and Beth, for, you know, like a fascinating glimpse into a world, which I will confess, I've done one workshop in Twine, and I can, I can still probably code in HTML, but that's about it. <laughs> and I don't know anything else. And um, that's part of the reason I wanted to have this workshop is because I feel as though as writers, we should be, you know, learning all the tools and, um, and we need experts to tell us what those tools are. So thank you very much for a really good overview. I have to say, um, question, um, the questions would be better coming from you guys in the audience, I think, than from me, because mine would be very basic. So um, there's one question that we've already got. Are there any good um, augmented reality creation tools that are affordable for writers? There's quite a few that are free, actually, which isn't always nice. Um, so uh, in terms of harnessing it for writers, it would be a bit, um, there'd be a little bit of, um, uh, yeah, there'd, there'd be, it would be worth, having a look at that in, in, in how you utilize it. But one that is actually a free app that I use, and I am doing that thing of just going down my phone through so I don't say the name wrong, it's Adobe Aero. So AE, Adobe, you know, it's the Adobe um, software. So, um, and then Aero, A-E-R-O. Um, and that allows you to take an image off your phone and, and place it in this kind of AR world. You, you, you know you kind of look at it and then you scan it and you place it in this AR world but that, that that's what I was saying before there are some there are some assets that that come with it so you can practice but that's nothing to that that's not to say that what you then place in that in that real scene isn't isn't a page of a book or isn't a clue to something or isn't a link to something that takes you somewhere else and I think that's what can be quite um exciting about these uh technologies because you can offer people breadcrumbs and lead them to where you want to lead them and that can be to the next part of your story or the next chapter 
Um, so yeah, for, for the augmented reality one, then I would look at um, Adobe Aero. There's also another one, but that is more to be fair for, for a kind of more of an artist. So that's art, art, art evive. So A R T I V I V E. <laughs> Um, could you could you spell that again? I'll I'll put it in the I'll put it in the chat. Oh, thank uh, you. So there's Adobe. Aero. You've got Adobe Arrow. Yeah, and then Arts in Vive. Ah, there we go. Oh, and then it would help if I spell it right. I type like my fingers are sausages. <laughs> Um, so that second one, to be fair, is much more a vis a visual and it, re it asks you to have um, a website or a blog or something that you link to. And it is it's set up for the visual. Um, you know, can you you can sign up for an account, but there's no reason why it has to be visual based. There's no reason why that can't be text based. And I think it's about being creative about how you use these and, and marrying that traditional and not kind of going, oh, but it's, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's for visuals so I, I so it's not it's not for me I don't you know I think that's important that it can be seen differently um we also had a question um could can we have that digital digital literature quote again please <laughs> let me um let me find that one let me uh okay hang on Beth I've got I've got it here okay cool let me just kind of I, I love the way that I'm I love it when people get me to multitask. <laughs> I'm just like, I can't. Well, I know I, can. I can't do it. I know. Here we go. <laughs> I can find it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's that idea that traditionally, if, if you do look it up, it's, uh, oh, oh the, the digital story one, yeah. And then, um, yeah, it's just really, it, there are many more complex ones that are a lot more kind of academic, but I just think that's just really nice and simple. It's just, you know, and, and, and a, a lot of time when I'm teaching, we talk about, you know, some, some franchises are brilliant at bringing these massive story worlds together. So when I talk to students, for instance, about um, Marvel Universe, Mm. one of the things I do is root it very firmly for them in its origins which is comics and books which is writing um so I always kind of you know bring it back to that and sort of like you know talk to them about I mean most of them know um you know Stan um, Lee, Lee, Stanley Lee but you know because he's in all the films um but what well, he was making guest appearances but yeah it's it's very much about about making that connection that these that these universes very often start in written form and I find that really exciting actually. What What is your own favorite way of creating you know sort of your digital art? Um, I I tend to if, I, if it's narrative then I'll animate. I'm, I'm really bad at not finishing things. I love technique and if I know how a technique once I've mastered a technique, I don't necessarily go for finished product. What I like about animation is you don't know if it's worked until it's done. <laughs> mm. You have to finish it. You have to finish it. So then if you're taking, you can storyboard it and you can know the story and you know where you're going with it, but you do actually have to finish it to check if it's worked. Um, so for storytelling, I really like animation. Um, mm obviously not to say that one single image can't tell a story but if I want to if I want to um unpack a narrative then I like to do that with animation um there's a, a slight problem with the chat not being updated um what a, if someone says what a great way to make sure you get to the end um, <laughs> yeah I I guess Michaela I, I would ask the same question of you um is twine your favorite? What is your favorite way to um, describe this word? It's not my favorite. Right. <laughs> and I say okay. that because <laughs> I say that because it takes so long to do. No, I, it, I the the style, mm. so the idea of a what we used to call a twister plot when I was growing up, or choose your own, I absolutely adore. I found twine a little a bit laborious. Um, I'm, I'm quite impatient 
and so the fact that I even finished it is a miracle really um but also it's actually more now that if you go on to the to the website um I'm glad you asked me this question because if you go onto the website now you'll see it's kind of mainly archive and it's very hard to attach a or to read a twine story unless you've got the twine software yourself um text adventures which is where I've I'm posting my I've post mine is great because it allows you it allows people to read it without needing the software themselves so I'm kind of interested in and I, I don't know what I'm gonna do but I'm interested in those multiple spin-offs but without be with maybe something that's operating online so you don't have to download any um software to to read it but mine is about being able to what I like about what I'm interested in is being able to immerse yourself into a text um, not that my imagination doesn't stop me from doing that, but I think when you start making decisions with a character, that gets very exciting. And I think that's where stories have gone anyway, naturally. Look at all the game, um, you know, the, the, the games, the sort of text-based narrative games that are out there. Um, that, that's enough to tell you that, but they're still behind a little bit in the craft of storytelling and narrative and the writing and the quality of the writing. Um, I, that's not my personal opinion. That's what a kind of a sort of feedback I see again and again. Um, and I would actually, I would agree with it, but I don't really play many games. But if there was a game for me where I could be making those decisions where it was text-based and it was there was some visuals but enough to kind of giving me enough to use my own imagination that's kind of what I'm I'm looking for um but I think for me the main thing is to experiment um and to mm. just play and to understand that play is very serious as well so you can have fun with something and it can be serious and you can you do, everything doesn't have to be high stakes you know, you're not going to break the interweb, you know, um, it's fine to just play. And it's, you know, if you don't want to put something up. Um, yes, that is the link. Thank you, Jason. Um, so if you don't want to put your own stuff up widely, there's often little ways you can, um, within a software platform, you can do it privately or do it through draft. So, for example, you can you can you can you can create an Instagram reel, which is on a draft. You can do the same thing with Facebook Live. And I think this terror that some that people are going to see us making a mistake, we a need to kind of find ways of protecting ourselves. Sure. But we also have to get over ourselves and just think, so I made a mistake. You know, and that's it's only by making that that mistake that you can make you can get you can move forward, I guess. No, I heartily agree with that. I mean, the the mantra in, in the literary world is writing is rewriting. Nobody usually thinks that their very first draft, unless you're some sort of genius, is the one that you want the world to see. I mean, for me, I actually have to go to five drafts before I can even send it in. And then I pretend that's my first draft because yeah. my first draft is actually so bad. <laughs> but um, there's um, there's a lot in there. There's another, um, for people, you could see textadventures.co.uk is where you can find what Michaela was referring to. Um, the idea of video games, the video game industry makes more money than the movie industry and all the other industries practically put together. And the idea that it's art is not new. I mean, they even review them in The Guardian. What more do you want? And so um, I, I, I think that I really want writers, the writers that we deal with and writers everywhere to realize that this is another avenue that you can use. Um, and talk, I mean, I read, I read the X-Men, I hate to say this, when they came out the first time. <laughs> and so, you know, I would love, I don't know how many people saw Spider-Man into, you know, into the Spider-Verse. Spider oh, <gasps> yeah. What a good movie. And if yeah. I could have like a game or something that took me in there, I would be in there in a flash. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, in a flash. Uh, yeah. We had another question. Um, although I'm not a writer, I'm really interested in the interactive podcast that Beth talked about. As a DI consultant, 
I'm always interested in creating more engaging ways to get the messages across. Where can I find out more? Um, with the with review to the podcast, I did chop, I, I dropped the the link to the site that I was talking about in there, but I will drop it in the main chat as well because um, uh, so the the Digital Dozen Awards, um, which I've just dropped in there. Um, so the, that that podcast one is um, if it's it's like a little short film and because they're just excerpts from the um, from from the awards that have been so there's there's all sorts of awards there's there's another one which has got the just the trailer for a a horror film that uses your webcam and I think um, I think Michaela and I were talking about that the other day and she was like no. <laughs> 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 and I was like, that's a little, because I, I love my, the horror genre. Um, but yeah, we were, we were talking and I, you know, so, but, but even for me, that was a bit that's slightly intrusive. Um, but I've, yeah, so I put the, I put the link to there. Um, and I believe, although obviously I won't, I, I won't double check whilst we're on this particular call. I believe if you, um, when you, go, when you click on the podcast one, it will give you further details of the makers and then that will take you out even further um to to um, more information but I did want to pick up what you were saying Cheryl about the um about I'm, I'm a gamer yeah that's, there it is I'll just put it out there I'm a gamer um so when you were talking about um games that do kind of help marry that there are games out there that they're not text adventures and they are using the latest technology um and you've you know there are games beyond the sort of like call of duty that that our mm. you know that our teenagers are are playing first and in fact when i'm teaching games i i take call of duty off the table as a conversation i'm just like you're not allowed to talk about it um and and, and those sorts of games but what i do put back on the table is like have you watched you know um and and there just as i said it have you watched heavy rain so heavy rain is a game but it actually deals with some quite heavy subject matters it's a film noir it's a really beautiful film noir heavy rain um and and games are tackling quite um emotive subject material now um so you you wouldn't have a while ago seen games that have um that have before you, you wouldn't have seen a while ago games that deal with say like the death of a child or you know or kidnapping they were all quite um you know violence was in some ways contained so because it was a horror or because it was a war a, you know a you know a battle game but there are other things out there now and and in terms of narrative I was saying to a friend the other day so I play The Last of Us I don't know if anyone out there is a gamer A and B plays The Last of Us but that is one of the best narratives I've seen but either in or out of of of, of film and it's be and by being placed in that world and being control and it puts you in this really um difficult position of playing at one point as an antagonist quite often um and then you know games are all about survival so so that idea of switching your audience and putting them not only because books do it brilliantly so you you look at things from the perspective of the the antagonist or if they're not an antagonist they're um the the um you know the anti-hero and for, you know i'm thinking like american psycho um you know where where you are immersed in his mindset horribly even though you don't want to be um and and games have the ability to do that but the participatory nature can take it that little one step further and i think um you, you know th there's a lot of separation between you know between genres or platforms and going well you know can I write for film can I write for books can I write fiction can I write you know whatever your writing style is but you, you I that that's it I said to a friend I said I think I'm done I think I'm done with games because I can't imagine a narrative that is that is going to immerse me and, and, and emotionally connect with me in a game the way that that did and then of course all my gamer friends like no you need to try this and I'm like but it was so beautiful and so poignant um and I, I, I'll say it here. I say it all the time. I say it in meetings. It made it made me cry. Um, and it's about the narrative. It's not about the game that's made me cry. It's the story that made me cry. It's it it's it's and the participatory nature of it enhances that. But actually, stories. It, it's like I said before. Stories are about immersion, and a really good story will immerse you. And some of these technologies will kind of 
take that to that next level, which is what I find really exciting about them. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I, I was always going to try and get game references in. Well, this is, <laughs> this is about digital. This is about digital literature, and to me, the games are also digital literature. It's yeah. about expanding our understanding of what the literary world really looks like, and you know, and why do we have to call things literary anyway? Mm -hmm. there, there's all sorts of different things, and it's really about the storytelling and the quality of the storytelling. Yeah. And what you were just describing sounds absolutely brilliant. And now I want to get that game. I don't even, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I want to get. Um, I mean, before we move on to the competition, is there, do you have a recommendation of, I mean, I, I guess you just gave an overview, mm -hmm. but if people are new to the whole thing, where would you recommend that they start? You know, what is a what is a a, a good way in for for games? Well, for games or for you know even for animation. I mean, can you find an easy way into animation? I did. Oh yeah, think? there's there's uh, there's there's like little apps that you can get for your phone. Again, she says refers to phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for those of us that remember and and still love morph beautiful little plasticine morph so Ardman animations just do a really beautiful little app called animate light and you you know what's nice about that because you know as writers there's a there's a physicality to what you do um but animate light because it's like a little stop motion and you can really get your morph on and get your little plasticine I'm my house has always got plasticine in it I'm not gonna lie and and it is just that you know really so you don't have to think oh I can't draw or whatever um, yeah, and it's a really nice little app and you can get it on your phones and I'm pretty sure it's not uh, an exclusive. I, I, yeah, so Animate Light, um, Animate It. I will find it again because- If you I, can find the- Yeah, if you can find the I'll, find the, I'll okay. find the exact I've, thing. I've put something in the chat, but I don't know if it's correct. <laughs> yeah, I'll find the exact one because like I said, I've got- Oh, I'm there it is. In, yeah, I was sitting somewhere. Okay, Jason, yeah. Jason beat us to the- Jason, yes. our digital producer, has yes. magically made that appear. Marvellous. So, yeah, that's a really lovely one because you can just... It's quite nice when I'm talking to people about animation and I just write, get, get your phone. And I make them do things like just, like, get a pencil to just, like, go onto the screen. You know, just get a pencil to go across. But it's, 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 very, it's very tactile. It's very tactile and it just uses things. You don't have to invest in lots of, you know... I have, uh, but you don't have to invest in lots of technology or, you you know, subscribe to like really complex programs. There are lots of things out there just, just allow you to play, which is really important in a creative process to just play. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. And I think, did you already say yours, Michaela? Am I asking you the same question twice? Uh, what's I was the question? About what, what did, you know, is there something you would advise to complete beginners to get into the whole digital literature sphere? My thing is, would, would start with actually doing a little bit of audit yourself of what is it that you enjoy doing? What are you curious mm. about? Because you, you need that motivation because even if it's really simple, there's always a kind of learning hump you have to get and that motivation helps you over that hump so if you're someone that adores um, morph then that's where you would you would try it I'm totally getting that I'm thinking I always want play-doh and I don't have yeah. any in the house that's just an excuse for me now end of um but also other things like if you're somebody that likes you know um you, uh, maybe a child of yours has been playing with Pokemon Go. It's like I only know adults that play that game, but I hear that children do as well. But you know, <laughs> that might be some augmented reality. Might I mean, I'm really curious about that, Beth, because you know, my imagined future of my mm. novel, one of the things that I think that could be engaging is that if you could ask, you know, if you could ask um, young people, if we keep going the way we are going with the planet, what would our few what will our possible futures look like mm. what will the hilton tower look like what will mm. that 
particular you know building look like or even just to play around with with stuff you know um but yeah I would I would start with what you are interested in because there is a hump there's not nothing is ever easy and uh and you need the motivation to help you over that hump. And that, and that's where fun comes in as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, do we have um, any, if you have more questions, you can still put them in the Q&A or in the chat. But I think that I'm going to turn it over to our lovely two panelists to talk about the going digital competition now. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks. I've just seen some great links as well from Maya Chowder in the in the chat. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Coming in. Um, so um, I'm just going to do a sort of brief introduction of the pieces, um, and we're going to chat about them. And <clears throat> excuse me. And Beth is also going to give her view as well because Beth is looking at things in a different way than I look look at things um but what we did do before we even looked at any of the entries is we, we we thought about how are we going to judge this i mean i was quite frankly a bit terrified um beth has done this before so she was great because she was like oh well you have to have this and this and this so she had a she had a did you have a form or a kind of table and all sorts of things? I was like, yes, this is beautiful to me. So these were the yeah, spreadsheet. <laughs> Um, so we were looking at, these were the things we were looking at. We we're looking at originality. We we're looking at techniques, writer's craft, um, themes within it. And our big one, we said, so there would be kind of extra points, would be the use of the format used. So how that person used the platform or the, the form that they were um, telling their story um, on or their poetry um so we 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 found that the all of the um submissions were brilliant and brave and people just sort of got into the spirit of it and really um you know kind of threw a lot of stuff at the wall and it was it was very exciting to watch these and and I think I said at the beginning and I'll say it again thank you so much I think mm. I didn't I didn't expect to be as inspired as I as I was so thank you very much that was it was a pleasure to judge um and so the so we we we'd finally narrow it down to three thank goodness Cheryl you are a genius three winners brilliant um <laughs> so we had um Chi um Nadubisi Nadubisi and her piece is called She Asks a Dying God this is an Instagram story told across nine posts um using video spoken word um and photography we absolutely loved the engagement with this uh, because she was straight on there with the social media platform um, this work couldn't have existed anywhere else it was purely digital born um, and I also loved all the different layers of text and images and video so Beth yeah so for, so for that one we talked about as well um, you know the that, that it was really good a way of using that that digital medium and I liked I and, and we talked as well about where the platform was most effective mm -hmm. because actually it was much because obviously you can get Instagram you can what you can look at it on your computer or you can look at it on your phone um and I think you, you know because when we were judging obviously because you don't want to be working with somebody going I'm just going to completely ignore you and go on my phone um so we we looked at it on screen mm -hmm. first didn't we but then actually it was it had you know, and, and, and this is the thing that we've been talking about, your story, you know, harnessing these technologies changes the experience. So it had it resonated for me a lot more actually looking at it on on its on on a mobile format and, and just the just the flow of it. Yeah. 100%. Um, and that and the juxtaposition of the um, the images with the story was I, I thought was lovely, basically. Yeah. It was lovely, yeah. So our second winner was Princess Arinola Adegbite. Um, and that was a piece called Drapetomania. Um, and 
you'll see for yourself. So I'm not going to say it's digital spoken word poetry mm. performance and the things that we talked about that I loved about it. And uh, we, we kind of agreed on this one, yeah. uh, unapologetically political. Yeah. And in a, in a way that political is also sensual, political mm. is vulnerable, political is all of these things and really lovely, really provocative. Um, and, I, and I felt that it had this potential because of its specificity um, that we had the potential to fit into multiple platforms. So we could see it, we could see it on our phones, we could see it looking at Facebook on, on our computers. It just seemed to, it, it seemed to, it appeared like it would travel well so yeah. it kind of got extra uh points that way as well over to you beth i i the, the, what i liked about that piece we did say it was unapologetic and in some ways because um you, you, is, is it all right to say what it looks like or do we not want to give it away <laughs> no no you i mean you but, can i, I yeah. save that for you yeah so so basically because it's, it's it's a spoken word but it's but it's a focal point so you're you're, you're focusing on here and that's really powerful um and it's also quite um it used some really um powerful coloring and it was quite visceral in a way um and it was quite confrontational but in mm in in a way that it didn't want you to escape from the words being spoken and for me visually that was impacted by the oversaturation of colors that were used um so the whole thing was was a kind of quite confrontational mm. experience um and you couldn't help but hear what was being said and i thought yeah. i thought that was that was really important mm -hmm. And that that tension between what yeah. she's saying and this sensual mouth, this, mm. and then the occasional kind of snarl. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, very, really, really good, really. So we love, we love that, as you can tell. Loved all of them. <laughs> um, and uh, the third one um, is by Lucy Sheen, mm -hmm. and this is called "I Know Your Face," and this is a poetry film. And obviously everybody has their own interpretation. So my interpretation is that it's about belonging, identity and about adoption. And like the, I particularly liked how it starts and the, the body, it starts with the body, but then it goes right into the pixels of that body. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a very interesting use of visuals. Um, I liked the metaphor of this kind of the cells and the genes that make up who we are and that being sort of flipped onto a sort of big, bigger picture that's made up of different people. So I thought that that was really clever. And I, I, I like the fact that it was, that, that it started in the abstract, both in the, in the, in the wording and in the, in the visuals that you presented with. And it was that, that, like you say, that, that close up and you, you're, you're kind of like, what am I looking at? What am I listening to? How are these connecting? And it, you know, there's a lot of times where it pulls out and then, and, and then in the same way that the image gets revealed, for me, the story got revealed in the hearing of it um and in the, in the telling of it and in the hearing of it because I think with all of these the the idea or with with both of these should I say more so um draped mania and I know this face you, you know that that juxtaposition of visuals and two diff very different approaches but both draw you in to to the words so again I use the phrase for you can't help but hear what's being said and I, I mean here on an emotional level obviously as mm -hmm. well as an auditory level as well yeah so yeah I found those um yeah rather marvelous yeah and I think that the order that we're now going to show them is um Chi and Debussy she asks the dying god and that was the one that is the Instagram story um, then we're going to go on to um, Draped to Mania by Princess Anne Ola Adegbiti. And then I think the final film is Lucy Sheen, I Know This Face.
Once upon a time, there was a dying god. It found a shoreline to see out the rest of its time. The god slipped into a crack in the cliff face. There, within a network of caves, it made a home, a mausoleum. Sat in stalagmite jaws, eyes always to the horizon, face pressed against ice-cold walls, it waited. It wouldn't be long now. Cheeks against rock, flint against chalk. It counted down in tidal breaths. A rush of water in, a rush of water out. Once, upon a hill, there was a village. It rose out of a rocky outcrop, like mottled fungus, like lichen. Its foundations reached finger-like projections into stone. And the walls grew up, puzzled against rock face, sheer plains of brick between boulders. In the mortar were the locks of the god, fine tendrils of hair, mycelia with flowers that kept time. Delicate bruises blushed, bloomed, evolved and receded with the seasons. A rush of colour out, a rush of colour in. Once, there was a dying god in a cave by a sea. There was a village grown against the hill, its stone walls mottled with a fungus and argi. Almost camouflaged, only sheets of glass gave them away. The houses had large windows, all the better to watch the fishing boats come home, all the better to keep the sky in sight, to know when the storms were coming, to keep the light framed for the lost. The homes, shoulder squared against shoulder, glowed warm, kept each other like sisters. The people made their town beautiful. They kept a library, a tea house and a pool. They had a school filled with children, a bakery with multi loaves and well-stocked bookshop. There was never want for a good pen, a generous notebook with quality paper. There was a lighthouse and a broken clock tower. Sea salt had long corroded the machinery. The villagers let the moss hang from the frozen hands and drip clear pools into the lush gardens beneath. There was no church, no mosque or synagogue. There was a pub, two in fact, and a smaller bar that served as a place to gather and talk and sing. They learned to pluck rudely tuned strings made drums from rough surfaces and completed their orchestras with flutes, pipes and trumpets. The music offered to the sea was throaty and bellyful. They distilled whiskey and anointed the ground when occasion called for it. And for those who chose the sea as their vocation, this occurred more infrequently than you would expect. The people of the town knew of the god. At first, they sought it out, to adore, converse with, and confess to. They soon learned this god had no wish to be worshipped. It remained grave in the face of their petitions and coolly silent in response to those that begged for intercession, for revelation. And then there was the incident. They knew then not to force a temple into a grave, and not to approach the dying God, not without solemn reason. And she had one, a reason that had long lost its rationale. It sat in her bowels, a barbed and quiet madness that ate away what she had made of herself. It stripped away four decades 
of hard-won wisdom and knowledge. It took from her all sense and fear and made her a child in the face of her task. Single-minded, sure-footed, she navigated the labyrinthine system of caves. She did well to follow her want. The dying god did not turn her away. She met its eye and asked in a steady voice. Unlike a child, she was not entitled. The request had no sentimentality. It had no presumption of right. It had no weight of ceremony or ritual. Her request was a slight thing, almost lost in the ocean below them. But nonetheless, the god heard it and acquiesced. It heard and assented. The cost was as simple as the request. And to the god's credit, it was not impossible to pay. Dreptomania, lucid in a mad world. Fee, fi, fo. I beat Goliath in one blow. Philistines got guns but no ammo. Remember the Pharisees called themselves holy but it was all small. They put divinity on death row. I can't forget what Belgium did to Congo. It's etched into my frontal lobe. Rest in peace, Patrice. Cosmic Negro, my hero. I know I inspired Picasso. My poems prick hats like needles. I bat back at patriarchy because he's evil. Love should be our fuel. Yet we're raping our mother for coal and diesel. I'm smoking a bushfire while the ocean's nausea swats to sea foam. This got me musing on the nature of power like Foucault, men in suits. Slipping through discipline and punishment loopholes. My tongue is my pistol. So I don't answer to wolf whistles. So a homeless man die by the needle. How can money and love ever be equal? Sickle cell but my words are chemo. Princess of peace, only pure hearts are my equals. Never live in bad faith. I'm in love with every line mark and crinkle. Every secret, every thought, a time capsule. I learned everything I know from Queen Sappho. Excellence is in my genome. Always at the peak, I can't plateau. Even when patriarchy stalks me on the way home. Come too close and I'll capture you like Calypso, love of my sister's mahogany or redbone. I don't believe in division or status quo because people will hate your vocals when they can't hit a note. They say the black sheep always becomes the goat. It all makes sense now why it never did. Why everyone who hurt me fell off the grid. Half-baked like kids in amniotic fluid. Across from silicone is skid. Carnage and sewage. It's sick. All the powers given to the rich. They're the pimps and were the tricks. We have an Amazon website and a dying rainforest. No wage up term, but Boris is cutting universal credit. Too much nepotism. Senseless powers politicians inherit. Matt Hancock was getting head while asking the public to grin and bear it. Zoom funerals, the evidence that the establishment is an embarrassment still. I got new war joy. Everlasting on God given so no man can destroy him at the pinnacle and it's still not my highest point. I don't trust pigs. Agents of conflict that go oink, oink, oink. I'm living in God's manuscript so I must rejoice, Joyce, Joyce. Life is like Ulysses James Joyce noise. You can't steal my spirit or chain my voice. Poetry chose me. I didn't have a choice. I carry my slingshot, so talk to me nice. Fee, fi, fo. I beat Goliath in one blow. I know this uncharted face, a topography worthy of exploration, an epidermal physiognomy that has lost so much and not just in translation, a misplaced blueprint. I scan the image, wondering which features I share with a mother I never knew, or how similar is this face to my mother's? A face that my fingertips will never caress, nor trace the curve of her cheek or feel the flush of her skin. The provenance of my face is unknown. My eyes will never linger over an image of my creator. This face will never see itself in my mother's eyes.
or turn over a sepia crackled photograph puzzling over the copper plate script that says so and so on this date with mum. Do I age as my mother did? Time drags skin and memories towards the earth. What passing relevance is left? What would the mother of this face recognise? My eyebrow? My forehead? My mouth? And upon seeing my face then say, That's my daughter. I have long surrendered any hope of seeing myself in my mother's eyes, of taking tea in an unfamiliar front room, sensing the colour of a clear water-weak sunshine winter afternoon, or pausing with nerves alert to every minor vibration as I ask, Are you really my mother? <laughs> Scenarios play in my head. Dreams of reunion, I run in slow motion through softly diffused colours towards my mother. Waking instead to the mute motherless tones of reality, having travelled unaware with the pain of accumulated years. Does my mother still walk with measured steps across some path? The meaning of the word mother is lost, almost impossible for me to grasp. In all the intervening years I have felt no anger towards my birth mother. A sad and empty spirit haunts me, the unknown ghost of my mother's lost smile, the silent breathing of an unoccupied chair. Has my mother passed? Looking at this photograph, eyeing with age and experience, my losses and regrets all neatly unpacked. I see every individual image, interlocking, intersecting, merging, connecting, aligning, forming one complete picture. I cannot change the past, but I can affect my future. I can write my own script, flipping the picture and on the back write... To my darling daughter with much love, Mum. Well, I have to congratulate all the winners. Those were absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm blown away, actually. This is exactly sort of what we wanted when I had the idea of doing a competition is finding new voices and new ways of framing those voices. So um, thank you to Princess Aranola. Um, I'm not gonna uh, massacre your last name, to she and to Lucy for creating such wonderful things. And thank you to Michaela and Beth for doing a workshop in prep for that competition and for all the wonderful things that you've done today and for finding, you know, explain and helping to frame and explain what, why those particular um, pieces were so good. Um, truly appreciate all of that. It's wonderful. Um, I think that they've, they've already got them up on YouTube if you want to watch them. Um, the links are in the chat. And uh, and she, uh, as you said, was best on Instagram, and it's on Instagram. So you know, I I'm I I'm sort of I don't know what to say. That was really really beautiful. And again, thanks to our two lovely judges for doing all that. Um, a poll has just popped up on your screens, folks. This is um, our lovely funders, you know, the British Council and the Arts Council and all our other funders. This helps us get more funding. It's very short. And if you could complete it, if you could complete it, we'd really appreciate that. Um, and that's, I, you know, I can't believe we've come to the end of that. That flew by. And uh, I hope that we do this more. I certainly want to get you both back to do more. Um, more of those workshops helping 
I think that we now need a regular digital workshop. I'm going to ask Pete about it. He's our other, our other chair. So that, you know, even if it's only once every three months, just, you know, to give people a chance to try some of these things out and, you know, and just hear more from the both of you. Um, thank you to everybody. Thank you to our team um, behind the scenes, which is our, our digital producer and our digital assistant producer, Jason and, and Melanie. Thanks again to Michaela Sonola and Beth Senior. And congratulations again to our winners, Lucy Chi and Princess Aranola, who did such wonderful work, wonderful work. Uh, what a great afternoon this has turned out to be. Um, there's more about, you know, doing stuff on the socials, in the chat. Uh, remember that you can save the chat and then you can, you can also, there's, a, there's actually a live trans, transcript. I've been saving the transcript so that I can, you know, go back and, reread everything that's been said because I couldn't follow all of it. I'll have to admit I'm not good enough, but I'm going to learn. And uh, and that's it for this afternoon. So thank you everybody. And thanks. Um, we can't save the chat because it's, ah, uh, hmm. Well, you know, we're, we're recording um, the session and when our producers have, have finished playing with it, it's going to be up on our website. So anything that you didn't get today, you'll probably be able to get sometime in December. And on that note, you know, come back and check us out. Thanks again to our lovely panelists and to everybody who's come from so far, you know, India and all over and Perth. And, you know, thank you for coming to join us today. Um, can you put the link shared into the YouTube, please? Um, I'll see if they can do that. Uh, that's a request to the host. Um, and that's it really. Um, unless there's anything else, I'm going to say goodbye from Common Word for today. Bye. Thanks guys. <laughs>